collection cluster together with my colleague uh, Katrien, who I have also seen online. Katrien, if you can uh, make sure that your camera is on so the colleagues can get to see you. This is the first time actually that you join one of our events as our new co-chair. So we, we are very happy to welcome you to, uh, to the work of the task team. And with this, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to, of course, introduce you all to Paola Barsanti, our legal aid specialist that has been working with us uh, for the past couple of years on this fantastic project on legal aid in humanitarian settings. And Paola, I let you take it from here. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Martina. Uh, thank you to everybody for making the time to attend uh, this fourth webinar on uh, engaging with informal justice uh, actors and mechanisms to respond to legal aid and justice needs uh, in humanitarian settings. Uh, we have a wealth of participants and speakers and attendants today. Uh, we have among us representatives of uh, UN agencies from the development, peace, human rights and humanitarian uh, spheres. We have practitioners, specialists and research representatives from uh, international uh, uh, organization, from national organization. Uh, we have also some uh, donors representative, uh, thanks also for for their active participation in supporting uh, this uh, important project within the Global Protection Cluster Task Team on Law and Policy. Um, your uh, active engagement is very much appreciated. As I was saying, this is the fourth of a series of uh, webinars. Um, which uh, started uh, last year. Uh, we touched upon uh, legal aid needs in crisis settings uh, uh, in, under different perspectives. We looked at reparation context, the transitional justice context, and we look at legal aid needs to protect the right to legal identity uh, last time in May. Um, today, uh, the, the topic uh, is uh, engaging with the informal justice sector and uh, as I said, and as you can see from the, the agenda, uh, we have fantastic uh, speakers. Uh, we will uh, open uh, with the introduction uh, from UNHCR. Uh, Bernadette from the uh, Division of International Protection, uh, UNHCR, and Stefano from IEDLO. Uh, and then we will uh, pass on to the panel members. Uh, we will facilitate an, an interactive and very rich uh, uh, exchange between uh, uh, many speakers uh, coming from uh, uh, IRC, International Rescue Committee, uh, from Community in Need Aid. Uh, Daniel, thank you again for taking one day off your leave. And from uh, UN Habitat. As you can already appreciate from the list of uh, uh, speakers, we have representatives also uh, um, that reflect upon the challenges related to the different areas of responsibility, uh, child protection, uh, GBV and housing, land and property. Uh, without further delay, uh, I'll uh, give the floor to uh, Bernadette. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, over to you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for organizing the webinar. Uh, so um, I will not say it at the end, but uh, many thanks to the to the task team on law and policy of the Global Protection Cluster. Uh, and of course, uh, many thanks also to my colleagues from IDLO and IRC, uh, but also UN Habitat and the community in need. Aid. And very nice to see you again, uh, Daniel. Uh, I think uh, on behalf of UNHCR, we're very uh, happy and, and uh, excited that this webinar is happening. Uh, access to justice and legal aid for forcibly displaced uh, people is really critical uh, to uh, their protection. Uh, but also to prevent uh, displacement uh, and, of course, to achieve solutions. Uh, it's also fundamental uh, for inclusion and to really support uh, those in need with uh, uh, their exercises of their own rights. Uh, it really cut, it's a very interesting area of work for protection practitioners because it it cuts across uh, many protection interventions, whether 
it be on uh, child protection or uh, protection from gender-based violence or uh, housing and land, land property. It really um, uh, involves um, uh, many actors uh, who work on different uh, areas of needs uh, when it comes to the protection of forcibly displaced people in, in particular and in general uh, people in need in humanitarian settings. As UNHCR, uh, we work closely with uh, many of you, uh, a range of humanitarian development, but also human rights actors on access to justice. Um, it's a work that we see intrinsically linked to our community-based protection work, uh, but also to our people-centered solutions approach. Um, we have invested considerably as UNHCR, uh, both as an agency and as uh, the lead for the, for the Global Protection Cluster over the past years, but we acknowledge that uh, we need to do more and I really welcome uh, in this regard this, this webinar among other initiatives that, that we are taking jointly with many of you. Um, it's an area that needs investment, um, but that also uh, really has the potential to uh, foster partnerships in uh, under new lights. Uh, and what uh, we look at also from our perspective is how uh, in particular when we talk about uh, informal justice systems, how it actually um, increases also our work at sub-national level, both with uh, uh, authorities uh, at, um, uh, at local level, but also community leadership. Uh, today's uh, webinar uh, will indeed focus on uh, informal justice systems and customary solutions. Uh, I really hope that uh, practitioners will will get away from the discussion uh, with uh, tips on better engagement with informal justice systems uh, and uh, that um, uh, in the future we work uh, well in, uh, in and that you explore the possibility of really coordinating uh, our approach to this work um, i'm also hoping that um, you'll be able to identify uh, ways to efficiently support existing uh, informal uh, justice systems that exist. Uh, and I think very importantly that we all keep in mind that uh, all these efforts are really uh, meant primarily to make sure that people can exercise their rights, as I said before, and that, uh, you know, it's a way for us also to reach to those who are sometimes uh, and maybe in certain settings too often left behind in crisis settings. So, uh, with these few words, I uh, I uh, pass on the baton to to the, the pa to to Stefano and uh, wish you all a very good webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Bernadette. Um, Stefano, thank you so much for taking uh, the floor. Uh, just a reminder to, um, to the audience, for those who uh, are, are still joining now, we are, we are uh, many on the call. Uh, the idea of today's meeting is really to look, as uh, uh, Bernadette suggested, at three aspects. Uh, that we analyzed also in the series of webinars before uh, today. Uh, the three aspects are related to coordination, uh, partnership and uh, hard to reach population. Uh, for the first one, as discussed uh, previously with um, many of you and in particular the colleagues of the task team on uh, law and policy, uh, we mean how to better bridge the gap between uh, humanitarian and development assistance and creating functional and effective platforms 
owned at uh, national level and with the active participation of justice seekers and justice providers. With partnership, we really mean looking at ways to increase the sustainability of the intervention, ensuring that the ones we serve are at the center of the justice solutions. And uh, the third aspect, which I think comes very handy uh, for the topic today, is related to how to better design and implement strategies and uh, projects and initiatives able to reach the one uh, more in need and hard to reach either geographically, uh, politically or for other uh, reasons that the speakers will, uh, will talk about. Uh, without further delay, Stefan, over for, uh, to you. Um, I'll be uh, I'll be kind as a moderator, but uh, please try to stay within the, the 10, 12 minutes. Thank you so much, Stefan, over to you. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you everyone for being here. So, um, sorry, the slide. I'll go quickly on the first one. Paula already anticipated the focus of this webinar. So what I will try to do in the next 10, 12, maximum 15 minutes, I promise I will stick with that, is actually providing some concrete example of the different challenges and solutions that we have identified. So let's start with coordination. Now, a clear example of an effort for enhanced coordination is the development of a diverse pathways to people-centered justice report, which was actually adopted by a coalition made up of about 30 organizations. The fact that about 30 organizations active in the CIJ sector agreed on the content and recommendation of this report is already evidence of the possibility of coordinating the work of the different developmental and humanitarian actors. But let's highlight a few key conclusions of, of this report. Now, a first conclusion actually, uh, which will not come as a surprise and actually is not on the screen because it's, it's a well-known fact, is that most people resolve disputes through CIJ. And in fragile and conflict affected settings, so settings where humanitarian actors are normally involved, about 80, even 90% of all disputes are dealt through uh, CIJ. Now, an interesting conclusion instead of a report is that formal justice institutions often face the same challenges of CIJ. Now, it is widely pointed out that CIJ systems can reflect unequal power dynamics, can reproduce conservative social norms. But what is less emphasized is that formal justice institutions actually are not exempt from the same flaws. And are really these flaws that often push development partners to provide justice sector support to formal actors. Now, a second conclusion is that CIJ system should not be considered as a second best option. A recent study conducted in Liberia revealed that even if formal justice institutions were ridden from all their challenges, people would still rely on CIJ. They're quicker, they're cheaper, they're closer to justice seekers. A third conclusion, again, this will not come as a surprise, is that Justice spending has been reduced significantly. Between 2018 and 2021, it was actually cut by a third. There was an estimate that was done on the cost of delivering formal justice in low-income countries at $13 billion. The interesting aspect of the report is that it recommends using customer and informal justice as a good alternative for provision of justice to basically close the justice gap, given the limited available resources. And then, uh, Finally, uh, the report actually emphasizes another challenge, which is that some development partners are sometimes unwilling to work with CIJ actors, mainly because of three key reasons. The potential human rights violation connected with CIJ systems, the limited ability to showcase the impact of the aid provided to CIJ, and also the inability to work with non-governmental justice institutions. To counter these arguments and actually propose solutions to be discussed with potential donors, the report identifies multiple entry points, building data and knowledge on CIJ, which can actually showcase the impact of the aid provided, empowering justice seekers through legal aid and paralegal aid, and this is something we're going to discuss today, to basically limit the risk of human rights violations, 
and fostering collaboration between formal and CIJ mechanisms to overcome this limitation on the ability to work only with CIJ actors. Now, I will explore some of these points in a few minutes. I just wanted to mention the six recommendations emanating from the report. I would not be able, unfortunately, to analyze them. We don't have the time, but just to mention them. Oh, sorry. I don't know why I arrived at the end of the presentation. Just give me a second. So the first one is actually to adopt a justice ecosystem approach. What does it mean? It means recognizing the critical role of CIJ in ensuring access to justice for all. The second recommendation is to deliver a step change approach for engagement with CIJ providers, which means grounding the approach on evidence that would allow to then upscale successful results. The third recommendation is to empower justice seekers, especially marginalized groups. The fourth is to advance women and girls' participation and leadership in CIJ systems, and we will speak about this in one of the examples in a few minutes. The fifth one is to create tools and platforms for engagement among development partners to have dialogues on positive experiences, challenges, and lessons learned while engaging with CIJ, which is, of course, what we're doing today. And the final recommendation is increasing investments in people-centered CIJ systems, which will help close the justice gap. Let me now move to more concrete examples, which we all know. Um, now, in many countries, like I'm sure many of you, for instance, in Somalia, Uganda and Kenya, we've been actively engaging in rule of law platforms, which are key mechanisms of coordination, sharing experiences on the work done with both formal and informal justice institutions. We recorded two main challenges here. The first one is that these platforms are not always country owned and can be driven by development partners. The second challenge is that they are predominantly dominated or actually attended only by developmental partners and not humanitarian actors. To address these challenges, of course, two clear recommendations emerge. The first one is promoting the establishment of nationally owned rule of law platforms. And we have a good example actually in Somalia, where there is a rule of law platform where both IDLO and our friends from UNDP who are now here actually attended and used for coordination. The second one is the inclusion of humanitarian partners working on complementary solutions. Now here I would say that our host UNHCR, for instance, would be very important in any platform dealing with CIJ, given that CIJ mechanisms are often used as a key venue for justice for both refugee communities and internally displaced persons. And this could be a concrete way of really bridging the gap between development and humanitarian interventions. And again, it's up to us to actually make these changes and ensure our engagement in these platforms. Now, let me move to partnership. Mm. The key element that we've been pro promoting in all our programs is sustainability through local ownership. Now, as you know, this is the foundation of the, of the human rights based approach. But what we've done concretely is actually co-creating projects together with local stakeholders. And here you can see on the screen a picture. This is, was taken in Rwanda. And here, here we had participants from the Ministry of Justice, but also representatives of the Abunzi, who are local mediators, customer and informal justice actors, who co-created the project and then were involved throughout project implementation to adjust solutions based on the problem-driven iterative adaptation approach. We have also promoted stronger cooperation between formal and CIJ actors while trying to establish partnership with local organizations. We've done so in Rwanda, Somalia, uh, Sahel, and if you want to know more examples, we can speak about it during the Q&A. Now, why did we decide to do this? Two main challenges. The first one is that the support to CIG mechanism is often considered as an alternative to formal justice institution, while in reality they complement one another. And the second one is that some development interventions are actually implemented directly by international or national organization, which prevents the establishment of sustainable justice mechanisms. Now, to address these challenges, um, I wanted to share with you some solutions which I think can be replicated beyond the specific context and beyond the country that I'm going to mention. The first solution is actually letting national institutions lead the implementation of their activities and promote venues for information sharing and accountability, but for both formal and informal justice institutions. Now, I will speak about a concrete example from Somalia. Um, I did know, but also our friends from UNDP, 
uh, we've supported the establishment of ADR centers, alternative dispute resolution centers. The ADR centers basically operate under the leadership of the MOJ, but are used by customary leaders to administer justice for the application of HER and Sharia and following reconciliation processes grounded on mediation and conciliation. Now, what we realized uh, when we were supporting these ADR centers is that in spite of this hybrid model, and we will speak about hybridization in a second, where CIJ actors work hand in hand with formal institution, there was not really enough space for direct and substantive dialogue between formal and informal justice actors and between the two and justice seekers. To address this weakness, what we did was introducing justice forums. Now, the Justice Forums are an interesting innovation which can be replicated. They are organized on a quarterly basis to allow justice seekers and providers to discuss specific justice challenges affecting the population, especially vulnerable groups, and then jointly identify solutions. The findings of the forum are documented by the Ministry of Justice, and the Ministry then shares the findings through the rule of law platform, which you see is coming back and is nationally owned. And this is evidence again that it's nationally owned. And the findings are used then to design interventions by both national and international stakeholders. Last week, I was actually in uh, uh, Somalia, Somalia and specifically to do the midterm review of this program. And we engaged with both justice seekers and providers. And it was really reassuring when they said that as a result of this process, they believe that the ADR centers are not owned by the program, but are actually justice centers that belong to the communities. Now, before I move to the next solution, um, I just wanted to mention quickly the role of the ADR centers in facilitating the provision of legal aid, which of course is the core of this discussion. Now, I will be very practical on explaining how it works. Um, in a nutshell, when a person comes to an ADR center in search of assistance, the case is recorded by a clerk. And the person is then sent to a paralegal, which is stationed at the center, basically sent next door. And the, the paralegal would provide the necessary legal advice. The paralegal is also supported by a center lawyer who provides more in-depth legal advice um, along with court representation when this is actually required. And finally, the center works also with community paralegals, community-based paralegals who have two functions, awareness raising on one side, but also helping the population navigate the justice system. And finally, for those who cannot reach physically the ADR Centre, there is also a justice call-in service, which of course um, mitigates security risk, prevents stigma, but also extends the reach of the ADR Centre, which is clearly relevant to the last point of discussion, how to impact hard-to-reach populations. Now, before moving to that, um, I promise this uh, other solution on hybridization. So, um, promoting a hybrid approach uh, to CIJ is actually a solution to many justice challenges. Uh, the hybrid approach, such the one uh, supported in Somalia through the ADR centers, where CIJ actors work very closely with formal justice institutions. This is proving to be extremely effective. Why? Because it combines the strengths of both uh, legal systems, the affordability, speed, and restorative nature of the CIJ mechanism, of the CIJ system, but also the individual justice and human rights aligned services that is typical of formal justice systems. Now, in all these countries, of course, to promote hybridization, you need to first convince both parties of the advantages of what? Of their partnership. Um, what arguments can be used? And these, again, are solutions that we would like to share and that can be replicated. A good argument with formal actors is the benefits of CIJ mechanisms, the benefits that they can bring, especially when it comes to the reduction of case backlog, which means that formal actors can then focus on more challenging cases and showcase good res results to the public. Now, for CIJ, uh, the argument is different. For them, it is important to reassure them that the creation of procedures, linkages with formal institutions will not over-formalize these processes. Now, concretely, in Somalia, Uganda, and Kenya, uh, we supported the introduction of standard operating procedures for CIJ actors. The interesting part um, is that someone could think that there was a resistance Towards, this, uh, towards these SOPs, because they would over-formalize informal systems. But actually, this was not the case. Uh, informal actors appreciated um, the fact that formal justice systems could work with them and could actually facilitate the enforcement of their decisions. Moreover, the SOPs 
introduced some processes, but still made sure that CIJ systems were grounded on customary law and that the mechanisms were still mediation, negotiation and reconciliation. And again, last week in Somalia, we got evidence of this when we spoke with a group of elders and they not only appreciated the SOPs, but they appreciated another innovation, which is the introduction of the notary service in the ADR centers, which makes the decision of the center's elders legally binding through the application of a notary CEO. So our overall conclusion on this solution is that it's important and actually beneficial to promote the establishment of these hybrid justice models. Last point, how to reach population. Just a drop of water. Mm. So let's start with the challenges. Three challenges. Uh, the first one is that awareness raising activities, if they're not coupled, combined with the expansion of justice and legal aid services, will lead to increased expectations at the beginning, but then will translate into significant frustration among justice seekers. The second one is that the role of CIJ mechanism in facilitating the provision of holistic services, including medical and legal aid services to GBV survivors, is often underestimated. And the third point is that marginalized communities are not always empowered to become justice providers. The focus is more on reaching them as justice seekers. So for all these three challenges, we'll try and um, highlight solutions, and this will be then the end of the presentation. I know I'm running out of time. So the first innovation is the introduction of mobile ADR centers. This is a key innovation that we introduced in Somaliland, and the aim of the mobile ADR centers is to reach especially nomadic pastoralist communities, but also people displaced by climate change. So how does it work? The mobile ADR centers are deployed based on geographic hotspots of insecurity caused by climatic conditions. Of course, these climatic conditions, basically extreme weather events, have an impact on nomadic communities, altering their migration routes, which put them into conflict with farmers. At the same time, it leads to displacement and then leads to conflict between hosting communities and IDPs. So these climatic hotspots are determined by the Ministry of Justice in coordination with the National Environmental Research and Natural Disaster Preparedness Authority. You can see we're speaking about national institutions, but we're dealing with justice institutions on one side and institutions that are more similar to humanitarian actors on the other side. Three mobile ADR centers have already been deployed in Somaliland in uh, hard to reach regions, remote regions, and in about a week, they managed to solve disputes, land disputes especially, which had been pending with the administrative authorities for over two years, which is really a remarkable result, preventing conflict. Now, linking back to our awareness raising, the services offered by the mobile ADR centers complement the awareness raising activities, but actually provide those justice services that are needed. Awareness raising activities basically focus on uh, uh, radio. Uh, through radio, there is a diffusion of dissemination of messages on the functioning of the ADR centers and the creation of a dedicated GBV hotline. So you just digit 109 and you would call the ADR centers and they would provide the support. And this is actually reachable throughout the country, which leads me to the next solution, which is the role of CIJ when it comes to GBV. Now, as you know, International standards recognize that handling GBV cases through CIJ mechanism is not advisable for good reasons. However, we believe that if we simply prohibit CIJ actors from engaging with GBV survivors and we do not offer an alternative, then you will just widen the justice gap. This is why we think that the introduction of ADR centers represents an innovative, pragmatic and people centered approach for this issue. So the aim in this case for GBV survivors is really to ensure um, effective referral mechanisms to formal justice and support services. So for GBV cases, the centers basically act as a bridge to the hospital, shelters, psychosocial service providers, the police and the courts. How does it work concretely? Uh, paralegals, we spoke about them, stationed at the center, they receive the case and they provide survivors of GBV with advice on how to open a criminal case with the police. When required, when necessary, the paralegals actually accompany the person to the police and to courts, ensuring that they receive all the support that they need. And all the costs are covered, including transportation fees. And another service was recently introduced just a couple of months ago, which is forensic testing. Now, you know that forensic testing is actually essential for uh, GBV cases, especially for sexual violence. Um, 
because otherwise prosecutors and investigators will not have the evidence required to build a case against the perpetrator of SGBV. And this is again an example of the role that ADR centers can play, CIJ actors can play when it comes to GBV. Last example, and then I promise I will be done, um, is the possibility of capitalizing on this hybrid model, and we spoke already about hybridization, to promote the role of women and vulnerable groups in the justice sector, but in this case, as justice providers. Now, speaking again of the ADR centers, the centers have actually promoted the role of women as justice providers. How? Through the SOPs. The SOPs, they require that at least 20% of the adjudicators are female, the adjudicators are basically the elders, and that a minimum of one female adjudicator participates in every adjudication panel, hearing a case involving women, or children. Now, the interesting element is that male adjudicators, again, um, I met with them last week, we spoke with them and we asked them about this innovation and initially they, they, they admitted that they resisted, but then they recognized really the value of having women adjudicators in the panel, especially for cases involving women. Now, besides women, there's been also results when it comes to other groups, especially IDPs. IDP leaders have been again included as members of the adjudication panel, and this has encouraged a lot of IDPs to actually access the centre, which is preventing conflict between IDPs and hosting communities. So now from all these examples, and here I'm really closing, I think we cannot conclude this presentation without reaffirming that there is clear evidence of the needs, and but also of the benefits of increasing investment in CIJ systems. And this is exactly what is called for by the final recommendation of the Diverse Pathway to People Center Justice Report. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stefano, and thank you, Ayat Law, for uh, taking this presentation very seriously. I think you framed uh, uh, the forthcoming dialogue between the different speakers uh, very well, and uh, we are all excited about reading the, the report that uh, Ayat Law, with the 28 partners, if I'm not wrong, uh, issued uh, uh, recently on the, on the matter. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, go back to the uh, to the dialogue with the um, with the with the panelists. Uh, thank you uh, again for the work that you have done to prepare your presentation. Um, we have uh, um, colleagues from uh, uh, IRC, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Chinook and uh, uh, Tito, um, uh, respectively uh, protection and rule of law and access to justice uh, uh, specialists, and uh, Denis and Chakrid, if I hope I'm pronouncing correctly uh, your, uh, your names, uh, from uh, Uganda and Thailand. We have uh, Daniel uh, from Community in Need aid uh, from South Sudan and uh, we have Jonathan from uh, and Mamadou from uh, UN Habitat. So, so thank you so much for being with us today. As I explained uh, before, so we will try to be as interactive as possible also to, to trigger questions from the audience. If you have any question to Stefano or to the panelists, uh, please feel free to put the, your question in writing in the chat so that hopefully we can uh, have a space at the end of the presentation presentation and the, the debate um, to respond to them. Uh, without further delay, we will start with the first uh, question on coordination. So I will ask each speaker of the, the three organizations to actually respond to uh, the aspect of coordination. Uh, so we, uh, we already heard from uh, Stefano some uh, challenges, but also some proposed solution uh, to make sure that humanitarian development, human rights and peace actors uh, are able to join their efforts in uh, designing and implementing uh, legal aid strategies and ensuring a coordinating engagement with uh, informal justice uh, systems and actors. So I'll uh, pass the, the floor to you, Daniel, uh, first to respond to uh, the question on coordination. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Paula, and I'm really very appreciating for uh, meeting Benedict today, Martina and all colleagues. 
And this is uh, a webinar. As I said before, I had to come back to attend. Very grateful to Stefano also for his presentation. It has been very rich and valuable. And of course, as he, he mentioned, most of the things that we may be giving uh, can be from a country uh, context specific. Those can be replicated in other particular areas. And I don't want to also talk about the relevant of uh, uh, supporting informal justice system or engaging with it, but I will directly go to uh, the concept of coordination, but want to say briefly on uh, the context of South Sudan uh, and of course most countries that uh, there is existence of legal pluralism. Both uh, formal and informal justice system uh, are operating together and, 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 and mostly you could see that uh, the relevance of uh, engaging the informal justice system is very important and, 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 and would have to speak on this, but to touch on the aspects of coordination and, and be able to come up with how best we can coordinate all these approaches. Uh, what I would say is that in the context, I want to first present that there are challenges uh, faced with respect to coordinating our approaches uh, as uh, humanitarian development, human rights and peace actors on this area. Uh, the first of these issues is the lack of harmonization of the programs and activities by the actors is one of the challenges that we, we encountered uh, in dealing with uh, these particular issues. And in the context, what I was talking about, that we tend to address uh, the issue of uh, ending child marriage and but be able to support informal justice through uh, developing that uh, laws, customary laws. And in that context, we need to uh, integrate our approach. But the challenge that comes is the lack of harmonization of all these activities that we we have. Uh, another challenge that comes on the surface is the sometimes you it, not clearly seen, but there seems to be a competition among uh, different actors on who will uh, actually take credit for uh, for the activity or for a particular project and then end us coordination. Uh, but as mentioned before, and I think I won't retreat to what the Stefano said, that there is a, 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 there seems to be a prioritization of supporting the formal justice system uh, at the expense of informal thinking that this is the alternative, but they complement each other. It's an issue that we see most of the uh, actors engage in supporting a uh, formal justice system. And I gave an example of South Sudan contact, yeah, which is a very good one. They have uh, uh, built the capacity, strengthening the institutional capacity of, inform of formal justice system, like uh, equipping specialized courts, GVB courts and juvenile courts. But however, uh, the non-appreciation of the complementary roles of this uh, justice system, both formal and informal, is an aspect that is still wanting. And again, because uh, the the customary laws are not written and the fluidity, uh, some of the actors seem to turn away from them because you could not easily ascertain uh, certainty and predictability of this particular area, of course, and it still is an important area that needs to be done. But I also want to uh, put across that another challenge that we faced in, uh, in the coordination is uh, inadequate or sometimes limited funding provide to support informal justice because it's not just only one aspect but also as well we need to deal with this but um again that uh, in the context of humanitarian setting uh, our, most of our responses are, are emergencies but supporting informal justice system is not an emergency so this is an area that i think are most of the challenges that we uh we encounter but still again there are also uh a good lesson that we can learn from this particular area that we have been uh, uh, also engaging in this area. And um, but before I go here, I need to say something. It's something that we discussed last time, and Benedict will be able to remember because it's something that he presented on. It's a fragmentation of our coordination uh, system as humanitarian. So it's, it's hard to come together because you have this particular cluster, you have the other sub cluster, and all this you cannot come up with uh, one solid concrete solution on addressing a particular because priorities will always be conflicting in this particular area. But the good lesson that we, we learn is that uh, through a joint programming and harmonization of our activities, success can be attained in this area. But uh, also there's a need for a comprehensive understanding and analysis of informal justice system. It has so many facets that need to be understood 
it's something that you cannot do within an emergency context. You may not be able to, you will be able to miss out so many things. We also learned that there is a need to integrate and I also need to, uh, to also appreciate uh, Benedict is an area also she presented in the GPC conference. We need also to integrate the centrality of protection in all our interventions as far as this uh, 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 supporting the justice contact is concerned. And, and then we also learn a lesson which is also important that conducting interagency trainings on complementarity roles of humanitarian development and peace actors is also important because we'll come to one solid understanding and say, okay, this particular area, these are the needs, these are the gaps that we can be able to support. These are lessons that we get from there, but also good practices. There have also been in the context of South Sudan intercluster coordination meeting, notwithstanding what I had said, that addresses issues, cross-cutting issues such as child marriages, and, and this brings together humanitarian development actors in supporting informal justice and, and be able to identify, okay, these are the gaps, these are the challenges that we, we can be able to program. But again, also what is also important is that collaborating with uh, authority I don't hear an, anymore. I think we've lost I think, Daniel. I think we lost Daniel, yes. Sir. Let me, let's just wait one minute in case he managed to reconnect. Otherwise we can uh, continue with the, with the next speaker. Um, and maybe he can catch up during the next, uh, series of questions yeah uh, yeah i think he's not um he's not connected so um, if it's okay if it's okay with you um i'll pass the floor to yeah i think we we lost him um uh, i'm waiting for daniel to reconnect i'll uh, i'll uh, pose the same question on coordination to our irc colleagues if i understand correctly is denise from uh, um, uganda uh, over to you denise thank you so much and uh, thank you everyone uh, like already mentioned, I'm Dennis Seluk from Uganda. I will be able to run through our thoughts on coordination with specific um, focus on one of our projects around strengthening integrated systems to accelerate uh, gender, youth and child justice, particularly looking at uh, challenges, uh, some of the good practices and also the lessons learned. As my colleague Tito will run through the slides. Next. So just heading straight to some of the challenges that we are able to pull out, like I've mentioned specifically to uh, what we have been able to do, we see quite an aspect of limited understanding of the um, of the complementary role between the informal justice actors and then the formal justice actors. For instance, we see informal justice actors being seen or considered inferior by the former justice actors and this is normally uh, mainly because uh, you know their role within the access to justice is somehow not very clear to everyone um we also see the limited trust in the uh, former justice system by the displaced communities quite because of a number of things relating to cost for example in access to justice the backlog of cases that we see within the former justice system some of the complexity and of course there has been instances of corruption tendencies as well as you know some other issues around the geographical reach of the ju uh, former justice institutions for instance, if I make reference to one of the rapid leads assessment that we did undertake under the same project, about 80% of the respondents in the selected refugee settlements prefer to have their matters reported and heard by the informal justice actors instead of the formal justice actors. This basically presents where we are coming from in terms of the limited trust. We have also seen the different sanctions uh, regimes 
uh, where we are talking about the adversarial and punitive versus the restorative and reparative uh, um, uh, sanctions regimes. For example, um, if I have to present that in the South Sudanese refugee community, uh, when someone has been assaulted and, for example, wounded, many of these cultures demand that the blood that has been spilled should be compensated for. Now, however, the criminal law uh, in Uganda is punitive and prescribes, for example, a custodial sentence for such offenses and may not be able to meet such demands as, uh, you know, could be advanced by the, um, the refugee communities. So finding a sort of a middle ground and meeting the justice needs of the clients to the satisfaction is quite usually a challenge in such instances. Uh, we have also seen a challenge around mandate definition particularly where we see the informal justice systems handle cases beyond what they are supposed to handle. Um, we know that usually some of their mandate is limited to simple, you know, civil cases like the land disputes, the aspects of uh, debt claims, and maybe simple family uh, disputes of civil nature. However, we find and tend to see that they often handle criminal cases that um, may be in line with defilement, domestic violence, which is actually punishable by the law of the country. Um, the other challenge, which is probably the last of this, in this is the information and data asymmetry which is coupled by the lack of uh, inter interoperable or standardized case and information management tools. And so this, again, from our, our perspective, uh, uh, do challenge us in identifying the gaps that we basically need to provide in terms of support in case management and in other instances of the capacity building uh, opportunities that presents itself. Now, amid all these challenges, we can still be able to talk on some of the good practices uh, Tito, if you can move to, to the next slide. Um, we still talk of some of the good practices. Thank you. Um, we have seen the integration of humanitarian justice development and the, uh, you know, the peace as well as the security priorities in the national development plan of the country, but also being able to formulate those corresponding refugee specific response plans on the different, you know, sectors of protection, education, health, as well as livelihood to help guide the implementation uh, as we interact with the refugee and affected communities. Um, we have been able to uh, undertake the multi-agency legal needs analysis, and, and this basically is for um, a shared understanding of the ju uh, justice needs, but also being able to identify the service gaps and services seeking behaviors of the crisis affected population. This in turn helps us to you know, inform the collective operational as well as the strategic uh, programming aspects. The other key good practice that we see happening is in line with the national level, um, uh, national and thematic level interagency coordination, particularly on justice law and refugee, um, on refugee protection uh, uh, matters. So again, this the secretariat, for example, has dedicated technical advisors. Where, if I talk about the secretariat, I'm referring to the Just, Justice Law and Order Secretariat of the country that has in place um, dedicated technical advisors for both the justice and informal justice approaches, with a particular focus on enhancing access to justice for refugee and host communities. While again, at the thematic protection working group level, where we see different sectors as just GBV, legal, community protection, as well as the child protection at the settlement level, but also coming at the district coordination level, where this group, working group, bring together different agencies, including the UNHCR, including the government ministry responsible for refugees, local government, police prisons, and the like, to be able to continuously map out the justice needs and develop collective uh, solutions to some of the issues that would be identified. Working with informal and formal justice actors, as well as the host and communities to develop an access to justice handbook for refugees and, and asylum seekers. So we have seen ourselves develop this due to a number of issues that have been uh, have been identified, limited knowledge both within the institutions, but then also with the people we work with to have a kind of a common understanding. 
just to mention this has been widely taken up for dissemination at the different levels at the country specific. Um, the other good practice that we can speak to is on the automated aut automation and standardization of the justice information and case management processes. This has really gone a long way to enhance coordination and disaggregation of the justice data sets in terms of the different information that is required to enable effective programming and response mechanisms. Um, Lastly, speaking to the promoting or the promotion of the representation and participation of the informal justice actors and refugees on the district uh, coordination committees, usually referred to as the DCCs. These are platforms that bring together um, of the formal justice institutions that convene on a monthly basis to consider emerging human rights and administration of justice issues at all levels, whether the settlement at the district, at the institution-based level, for example, the prisons, the police and the like, to deliberate and get appropriate ways towards response of this. So amidst all this, we pick some three to four key learnings for ourselves uh, that it is important. Um, uh, a conducive national policy and legal framework is important to foster structured and sustainable collaboration of these various institutions if really handled in that appropriate way. We also see that it is important to, you know, enhance or enable definition and assignment of stakeholder roles. Like I already mentioned, the role definition is very key. And this should be uh, further strengthened with a clear referral and complementary registries framework, uh, which is central for collaboration aspects. The other key area of learning that we see is um, an aspect of standardization around information and case management tools. For example, the formal system have their own process, then the informal, informal uh, actors really do just also not have that. So uh, being able to come together to ensure this standardization is very clear to foster referrals and, and, and enhance information sharing for the two different systems to interact jointly as and when um, required. And lastly, at this particular moment, is the aspect of being a uh, promotion of participatory and inclusive justice analysis that helps to facilitate shared understanding of justice needs and also the appropriate responses across the former and informal actors, which of course makes collaboration much easier uh, coordination much easier and a lot of things working together because there would be communication of all these aspects. So just about two slides of some of the pictures, pictorials to this event. Peter. Yeah, so this is just an example of the joint capacity building uh, session that brought together the former and informal actors in one of the field locations um, under the same project. An example of the hybrid DCC session, like I did mention, bringing together both the informal and justice, uh, the, the formal and the informal justice actors to be able to deliberate on issues of rights um, that affects the community. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Denny, uh, for this uh, very interesting contribution from uh, Uganda. I can see Daniel is back with us. If it's OK with you, Daniel, I'll give you the floor afterwards uh, on the second question, and you can uh, you can finalize the, the answer to the first. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan, over to you from uh, UN Habitant, uh, from, uh, with some reflections on housing lands and property rights and how to use the informal justice system to resolve uh, HLP disputes. Um, before giving you the floor, just uh, um, being aware of the time, if you can uh, stick to the five, uh, seven minutes so that we can have a, a, a section on question and answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Over to you. Thanks, Paola. Yes, I'll be as brief as I can. So my name, uh, just for an introduction, my name is uh, Jonathan Yakutiel. I work um, for UN Habitat within the land, housing and shelter section, and I work for um, one of our flagship programs, which is the Global Land Tool Network. Um, so on, um, on the question um, of coordination, um, we, well, 
in addressing uh, legal aid and uh, justice needs in humanitarian settings, um, the actors with whom we work uh, with, uh, let it be at the national level, uh, subnational level, local level, and uh, at the community le level, have drawn really valuable insights from uh, the Global Land Tools Network work, specifically uh, the, the tools that uh, GLTN have developed on uh, land and conflicts. And these tools were, uh, were, were implemented particularly um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the DRC, particularly in the eastern uh, region of the, of the country that has been plagued by, by wars and, uh, and, uh, and also in Uganda. Um, GLTN's initi initiatives within that sphere um, works on capacity building on land governance and uh, land management in conflict uh, sensitive uh, contexts. Um, and so we provide a holistic uh, approach to um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms that are within, uh, within the work of supporting uh, local communities in um, mapping, uh, land, developing the land information systems to resolve the land conflicts at hand that already exist and identify uh, within the mapping process other uh, the conflicts that, that, that emerge during um, the mapping processes at the local community. And so we develop um, these institutional frameworks at the local level through the mapping process, and within that, these mapping processes, we uh, we we established um, uh, um, uh, within those institutions developed um, uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution committees that would then, from the maps, uh, find uh, true mediation, find solutions to uh, disputes that arise. Um, how we start is that we first uh, we first understand the context. Uh, the understanding of the context is really uh, crucial for uh, for us for humanitarian actors when they want to address uh, coordinated engagement with informal justice systems. Uh, and to achieve that, uh, GLTN uh, conducts research and analysis of the existing existing informal justices justice system that already exists, uh, that are, were already set up by communities and or other, other uh, humanitarian or development uh, actors. Uh, our intervention, for example, in DRC and also in Uganda, in the areas marked by sustained uh, land conflicts, is, uh, is that, we, that um, the tools that we, we implement there are then adapted to the context and are then anchored in the existing mechanisms um, that that already exist, and and so we strengthen these existing informal justice mechanisms uh, at at the community at the, at the local uh, level. Um, we also work on inter interagency collaboration, and so um, international and local organizations uh, working in DRC and Uganda have recognized really the importance of resolving uh, land governance issues uh, uh, for, for resolving deep-rooted conflicts uh, by implementing coordinated uh, legal aid interventions. Um, and this collaboration involves a um, number of uh, organizations, local implementing partners, um, ETC, ETC, to share the ex expertise and ensure uh, a really a holistic uh, approach to to legal aid and justice provision uh, within with, within those conflict sensitive settings. Um, GLTN also focuses on knowledge uh, sharing, uh, which is a critical role um, by conducting research, uh, as I said, on land and conflict sensitivity issues to ensure that planned initiatives by government development partners and related in relation to developing uh, land administration take into consideration the, the the conflict sensitivity parts to pave the way for better opportunities for inclusion peace and coexistence in Uganda GLTN is currently supporting the government to develop guidelines for alternative dispute resolution in customary settings and in the DRC 
we um, we've developed tools uh, and we've implemented those tools to support the existing informal justice mechanisms to support them in 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 mediation and setting up land mediation uh, commissions. In terms of challenges, well, um, actors working in this thematic, for example, in the DR DRC often want to reinvent the wheel of what was previously done and therefore the sustainability of what was achieved in a particular area of intervention uh, becomes weak. And this is uh, particularly true when uh, mediation commissions then are set in place, the financing of a project ends, and then after that, um, the, the land mediation commissions cannot, cannot con uh, have difficulties in continuing uh, uh, the work. Um, in addition, um, as a challenge, uh, the ADR committees, uh, as well as in the DRC and in, uh, in Uganda, we've noted that they are not incorporated within the legal and policy framework, and therefore, while well, limiting the adaptation into the, you know, into the formal structures. Uh, this also makes the decision of the ADR committees not legally binding, and more is needed than therefore with the national and local actors and institutions to progressively build a cohesive justice system where formal and informal traditional justice mechanisms do not exist then in isolation from each other, but are rather connected to each other. And this is really a classical gap uh, that we could be that could be bridged, could be bridged. And even we see in the developed countries, this is where we're going into that uh, direction. And that's what we're trying to do also within the land information systems that we develop is to bring the 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 local registration into the national registry. And that then has to connect when there are conflicts, that has to connect also with the form of justice. And so at Jilton, we're very busy. Um, in those debates and in developing these mechanisms that really connect the formal, the informal to the formal and creating a, a continuum. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Very enriching inputs. Um, so, um, uh, Daniel, welcome back. Uh, uh, and uh, over to you for a question on uh, partnership and uh, uh, local ownership. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll just ask you to stick to the five minutes uh, so that we will have time for questions and answers. Thank you so much. Uh, good challenges and good <coughs> on uh, partnership. Thanks. Uh, th thank you so much, Paula and, and colleagues. I really apologize for the internet uh, uh, challenge, but I want also to begin from here. It's an aspect of a challenge to us. We are working on uh, supporting informal justice system, as I said earlier, that uh, uh, by uh, harmonizing the customary laws with national and international standards on ending child marriage. One of the particular things that we we working on with the partners is uh, in reviewing, seen I reviewed uh, one of the customary laws. We did not, we were silenced on the aspect of marriageable age, which is a risk factor to uh, cases of child marriage, but also developing one of the uh, customary laws in, in particular uh, area in South Sudan. But I want to say, beginning with this partnership, we've been with it with uh, LWF and, and, and other partners, uh, LWF being a development actor in that case, and with other partners. But I, I just say the internet issue. Uh, on the issue of developing a customary law, a particular uh, community, is that the internet has frustrated us. Uh, even today, we have not worked on the validation workshop because sending emails is another challenge on the other side. So let me begin from there so that we could move to as far as some challenges, key lessons, and then good practices, we still find to ensure that this particular sector is, uh, is sustainable and relevant in this changing society. Aside from the challenge of what I mentioned is that uh, sometimes there's a lack of, you see uh, partners, probably this international organization together with the national organization, there's sometimes a lack of contact uh, knowledge from the international actors. And this affects the, the partnership and actually the quality of the service at particular points, of course, as I will note, the important. But also different programming intervention uh, priorities uh, between the partners also sometimes affects the, the, the partnership in supporting the informal justice 
and we find that uh, one wants to move forward, the other one also has another pressing priorities, and you see in timing, you may not move forward at the same time. But also different uh, programming cycles. You have a project, you have received a funding and the project is running for one year, and that begins maybe in September, the project of the other partner begins in another period. So you, you come to the point that at a certain point, you're not able to complete and complement your activities uh, together in, in supporting an uh, informal justice system, like in the context I've given, in supporting um, the development of consumer law in, in building the capacity in strengthening the institutional capacity of these you'd see moving at different time could not be able to, to move. To. But there are also key lessons learned in respect to what I've said. There have been uh, a knowledge as, my, as a colleague uh, from the DRC and Uganda context also presented that there's a knowledge on the part and sharing of expertise by the partners. There could be an area that one is good at and they share. The local content is shared by the national NGO and then the, 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 the aspect of uh, the content comes from uh, the rich experience of the international organization and which I think is a good area in working with this particular uh, uh, sector and in supporting it. Also good practices, as I mentioned, one of the uh, word advocacy is ending child marriage and then through as uh, harmonizing the customary laws is that we were able to sign memorandum of understanding with the local authorities. One on ending child marriage with the Ministry of Justice, Ministry of uh, uh, Gender, Child and Social Welfare, and also with the judiciary in supporting the informal justice, but also in the uh, inclusion of, 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 of uh, on gender inclusivity in the informal justice, which my colleague also mentioned, I don't want to uh, overemphasize this. We also uh, look at another good practice is about the conduct of multi-sectoral needs with, with different actors together and been, and then also in supporting um, uh, informal justice, identifying those areas that uh, affect them while we do our work. And also we have had uh, cases of joint advocacy, which have been a very important area. Sina was, uh, some organization like LAM, we have been together and, and being vocal, speaking on the same particular aspect of child marriage together and also on women access to, to justice and also be able to access uh, natural resources. Uh, another area that we saw that was a good practice is, is hiring uh, legal consultants who will be able to review this particular uh, uh, customary laws and, and align them with international uh, national international uh, legal system. So it's particular uh, a good practice that we found, although there are those challenges, we saw that there are opportunities of still uh, partnership and still uh, collaborating together to be able to support and strengthen the informal justice system. And I believe uh, that will work. Over to you, Paola. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, very practical uh, uh, tips for replication uh, in other contexts. Um, over to you, Chinook, uh, on uh, some reflections uh, around Cameroon experience with uh, uh, women rights. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the time. Um, I want to jump directly into my presentation. I want to share my screen and I would like to share an audio. Um, I see someone sharing screen already. Yeah, uh, because we have made a little uh, video and I think it gives us a... Please, could you tell me if you can hear the sound? I'm trying to... Uh... Can you hear? Yes, Hello. we can. Okay, it's because it's in my hand. If, I, if we can, I will... Uh... I will give up on that. Not very tech heavy. Can you hear? You know, Can you we hear? had the sound. Yes. We had it initially. Now we can't. Not anymore. OK. No, unfortunately, uh, we can't hear it. But maybe you can uh, you can share it in the chat, and then we can uh, look at it uh, okay. afterwards. Okay, I'll give up on that then. <laughs> Too bad. Um, 
the idea was to make it a bit more, you know, different. Um, but it's okay. I jump to my presentation. Or oh, Tito, you want to share the screen, maybe? Oh, it's fine. It's okay. Let me share the screen. Uh, while we do this tech thing, I uh, load for. Um, let me introduce myself. So my name is Chinook Terrier. I'm uh, based in Geneva, working for IOC, um, and I support uh, West Africa and Central Africa in uh, protection rule of law. Um, before I begin, I really want to thank you for the time and also thank you the, for the presentation. Uh, many presentation, particularly the first one with the report and the recommendation, uh, resonate a lot in what we are trying to what we are trying to do and we're trying to, um, although in this example, uh, I see several recommendations that could actually meet with this presentation that I want to uh, to uh, to do. Um, I have noted the empowering justice seeker to become justice providers. I think that's really resonate and is what we're trying to do specifically in this example. Uh, advanced participation of marg marginalized group, um, create tools and approaches. I think that's really where we try to stand. and. Um, and obviously working with informal justice more and not taking as a second best option, but as primary actors, particularly in our out to reach and remote areas. Um, so um, that's one of the example of how we try to do that. Um, so it was a program we have called, it's, it's in Cameroon, in front of Cameroon. Uh, it's a women community paralegal. Uh, why we have created this program? Yes, you can, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so the program was justified by different uh, things, so needs first, always. of course, we want to be needs driven. Um, so we had activities there, we had a legal team that working specifically on documentation, and they came up with uh, needs, particularly for women accessing to land. It was a particular legal needs identified. GBV also um, is, a, is a huge um, gap that we always see, like access to legal for GBV in remote areas when there is only informal justice. So that was also the context. We saw a lot of, we were very remote, uh, no legal partners, we want no, uh, and major use of traditional customary and traditional law um, by everyone and by uh, choice also, but also because there is no access to legal justice anyway, to formal justice. Um, then the program set up because we were already there. We knew the inform we knew the pro we knew the community through our GBV and protection programming, we for legal programming, and we also have map. We already tried in terms of partnership to find a partner uh, who would be there who knew the community, and there were literally no partner, like no legal actors, even in the far away cities. There were like maybe one lawyer who couldn't move. So uh, we had to find a solution. Uh, and also, uh, we wanted to do that because it's justified by our values and vision. We really want to support community-driven, community-owned approach. Um, also recognizing the place of marginalized group um, and supporting women's voice, etc. And supportive maybe also while we try to have, of, as a first outcome, legal, more access to legal aid, legal knowledge, etc also try to support a more transformative agenda around so shifting social norms, uh, particularly for um, legal thematic, which may be a bit taboo, like uh, GBV and, uh, and HLP access to land for women. So um, that was one of the purpose. Next slide. So uh, first, how did we uh, how did we uh, build that? Next slide. It's just. <laughs> something true. So we had to select thematic, we had to select the paralegal women. Um, first for the thematic, we choose free thematic. We didn't want to do too many because uh, then it's a long training, legal training to do, <laughs> but we wanted to be uh, as uh, useful to, to respond to the needs. So first we choose access to documentation because it was a need for everyone and because also for this shifting things that we want. We don't want, to, we want to shift the idea that Women talk to women and women are here to support women's problems. Women can also talk for everyone and can support everyone. And so that's why we wanted to do the access to documentation um, to make sure that they can talk also to men. They can talk also and they seen as they're not seen as women. They're seen as expert power legal in their community who can support anyone around those uh, legal uh, thematic. Also, it's documentation, a less sensitive thematic. And we were really around do no harm approach. 
uh, risk management. So we wanted to take a phasing approach. So that's why access to documentation. And then we went to HLP for women because it was, as I said, one of the key issues identified. Um, it's a thematic, as we know, that's mainly uh, even, even through the formal law identified as a topic managed by traditional and customary law. So that's make even more sense to work with the, the informal justice and with the community around informal law to better dive through the systems that they know better than we do. Um, and then the GBV uh, thematic was because we had, uh, we knew the GBV was there. There was a lot of GBV issues. We had the team there, the GBV team to work with. Uh, and also because, uh, and that, that resonates again at the first presentation, because we, um, we we see that there is sometimes assumption that informal law will de facto be harmful, uh, informal law. Um, but, uh, you know, when we did the in-depth legal analysis, we saw that formal law is also harmful. So what do we do, you know? Um, so um, let's work with, you know, we want to be survivor centers. Let's be survivor centers. They want to work in this environment with those systems. So that's what we, we choose to do. Next slide. Yeah, and then after the select the thematic, we had to select the women themselves. So as I said, no one had a legal uh, background. So we choose women that was that had some experience in GBV because that's one of the most sensitive thematic. Um, and we just took those women, we try to have a minimum literacy uh, level, speak French, also to have this link with the formal justice, for example, because there is this language bias. Um, and and we developed the world manual and the world training to take them from the point zero where they are in terms of legal knowledge, I'm not <laughs> judging on anything else, and training them to become a paralegal, to, to know skills and competencies. So from this most easy one, awareness, sensitization, door to door, etc., to the most complex uh, mediation, um, legal assistance, etc., and that's so the manual has been developed in terms of phased and in terms of level of difficulty, and we provide this training um, with time. Of course, there is a lot. So the, this manual was uh, I need to uh, give back. Um, uh, so it was developed by a consultant who came and really helped us to do the whole uh, heavy work, particularly on the law. Uh, you know, we had to do an in-depth legal analysis on all of this matter to know what do we say for GBV, for HLP, what what is harmful, what's not, um, and how we orient when we guide people. What do we? And it was in a TOT format, obviously, because we couldn't. So we were doing that with a consultant to train our staff, uh, our IRC staff, to go train then the paralegal in every villages. Um, next slide. So then what was, uh, so quickly, just uh, to go on the, the results, success and challenges of this. Next slide. Here you can see a picture, a picture of the of the program uh, when we went there to uh, for the visit. So legal awareness was, you know, phase one, the first, the first thing we started with. So it was where we uh, had the most result. We had also a referral. So, you know, particularly for, and that's remained one of our challenges, one of the link with formal justice, because um, they are still far away. So. The, the system we have so far is referral to our team, IOC, who will then provide who has an MOU with a representative for representation, with a lawyer in the city, etc. So we still do the link, and that's one of the things we want to think for the future and how to link them directly. We had legal assistance, legal counseling. Was of the picture you saw was actually this woman going to the administrative. Um, going to help uh, families, not only women, but also men, to access their documentation, to talk to the administration for them when there is language barrier. Um, so very, so becoming this link between the systems and um, the justice seekers. Um, and finally, and that's where we were really impressed, it was uh, mediation. We didn't think, so it was the last level, you know, when uh, there was a lot of social norms around women who cannot talk in front of men, particularly not in terms of leadership and in front of authorities. Um, and it was part of our risk management at the beginning. We identify and we talk to those women to not identify the risk for them, but ask them what they wanted to do. And they were like, we need to have the support of the authority and the leadership. So that's where we started as IOC. We really try to support them. So the authorities, the local chiefs, the, the leaders 
we'll understand what they're doing and we'll support what they're doing. And we are at the point where now they request them more and they're, act, act, they're asking for them a lot of support. They're working together with the traditional justice actor, the wakil there, as they call them. We'll ask, we'll call them when there is a need for support for mediation and not only for women again. So that's one of the um, one of the big achievements for us um, and we have. And of course, we are trying to, you know, it's also one of the big impacts, a direct result, but is also supporting women voice, you know, uh, listening to those women is very, uh, has been for me very, uh, when they say that they'll become a role model in their village, like before that, they didn't see women as able to speak in front of uh, men or even in front of leadership or to be listened in those kind of matters. So we do see transformative um, things happening. Uh, next slide. And as always, we also see a lot of challenges. <laughs> you know, it's not always uh, so easy. Uh, so we are trying. That's why we are here in partnership, because we feel that our ambition, we are not there yet, but our ambition is to find this new way to our localization. We don't want to see localization as only having a local partner. It's because that's localization. We want to see like, OK, there is no partner. How you bring up those community driven, those community uh, people who know better informal systems than us to bring this uh, knowledge and this expertise to, to uh, better outcome and to better access to justice. So now we want to move to the next step with them to not only have this tech, technical legal training, but add this admin uh, budget, et cetera, level with our sector. It won't be me, <laughs> uh, but um, to support budgeting, organizing, et cetera, and help them build their own organization so they become a partner there for future other uh, actors who might want to uh, to work with them. Uh, I have listed many other challenges that they face. Uh, it's an hybrid approach because uh, it's, you know, training them takes a long time. We're trying to have phased approach so we can start immediately. But so it's more like on starting the program looks more like a development phasing. But then we work in conflict and we work in a conflict and humanitarian area. So we need also to have this a possibility to be flexible and to work on this conflict and humanitarian thematic. Um, there is a lot of um, th themselves when I li listen to them and the, the paralegals, they still have to work towards behavior change. There is good example, but there is also many not good example. It's not working well everywhere. There's, you know, it's a work in progress to be accepted and to be uh, to uh, understand that uh to um, to be accepted in their world and in their community everywhere in all villages um so that's one of the few things uh i hope i'm in the time and i think i'm good thank you uh, thank you Sinuk. and uh, it would be great if you could uh, share the link of the video in the chat uh, because it was working on, on my computer so it would be uh, good for everybody to just look at it um, and thank you so much for the inputs especially on looking at justice seekers not just as uh, rights holders and beneficiaries but actually to agents of change uh, in the um, in the building of uh, local par true lo and real uh, local partnership. Uh, so over to you, uh, Jonathan, on the question of partnership uh, and in particular on housing lands and property rights, again, from UN Habitat uh, perspective. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Paula. Um, on, on that question, um, our, our work um, on the thematic of supporting uh, the informal justice systems and land uh, management has been and land uh, HLP has been advanced to 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 partnerships uh, aligning with uh, first of all the GLTN uh, tools and its approaches and 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 then the implementation uh, of these tools um, in country um, in DRC for example we've coll collaborated uh, with the local partner uh, and the International Security and Stabilization Support Stra Strategy, which is a prime example of how we helped um, we helped the land the so the land administration in you know um, getting the, the the tools necessary for 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 strengthening um, um, you know dispute dispute mechanisms, um, particularly. Um, Showcasing the importance of, um, of 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 strengthening the informal the informal justice systems, 
uh, and such partnerships really have uh, contributed uh, to effective uh, le legal aid uh, strategies. And uh, for Uganda, for example, uh, partnership with um, the government through the justice law has been very key uh, in the in the implementation and sustainability of these informal justice systems there and, and, and then their mechanisms. It is important to note, however, that there is a, a strong importance in collaborating with uh, emergency and development actors um, in the justice system to address uh, HLP issue, issues uh, and, and to work better together between the emergency and the development uh, actors. Uh, from an analysis point of view, conceptualization of 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 of, the, of, of different approaches, and also the way uh, and 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 working together uh, in the implementation um, of working then alongside what we call the humanitarian uh, development nexus. Um, GLTN sees that uh, many uh, of the international and local organizations in the in the countries that we that we work have worked uh have worked uh, or that have worked indirectly with with us have used um these approaches um that we that we advocate and then adapting them uh to the realities uh in their specific uh context and so um how we how we do that is we we we, we really try and get uh local ownership in the processes uh, that we that we advocate, uh, and um, that's really involving uh, the the uh, different st stakeholders, governments, local community, religious leaders, community leaders, customary traditional authorities, in giving them the capacities in developing in in implementing ADR mechanisms, in in mediating uh, between between the different actors. Um, and and then and then finding uh, and ensure and then finding solutions um, to to conflicts if it's land uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, conflicts on on boundaries or if it's conflict for example in the DRC often we see the case of um, uh, uh, conflict between uh, national parks and and, and 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 the local community on where the border. Where the border lies, and so it has also environmental uh, uh, challenges uh, and aspects that 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 need to be that need to be considered. Um, but all of that um, really goes uh, goes into developing uh, the capacities at the local level and making sure that the the tools that have been developed um, are transferred then in a to at the local level and fits and fit the purpose and the context uh, of where of where it is needed. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so we arrived to the third and last question of uh, the, the, the panel today. Uh, so back to Daniel on uh, whether and how to best uh, engage with informal justice systems and actors to reach the one uh, most in need, but also uh, in some context uh, hard to reach. And again, when we mean hard to reach, we, ju we don't just mean uh, geographically, but uh, uh, for for a number of of reasons, so wonderful to have uh, uh, your reflection, Daniel, on on challenges and good practices. Uh, again, we uh, I just bear with me for the time so that we can also answer to the questions that uh, uh, colleagues have already shared in the chat. Thanks. Uh, th th thank you, Paula, and. Really, indeed, you you right. Uh, the, the the issue of hard reach is not about geographical limitations. It also includes other factors. And and in the context of what we are doing at Sina and, and and presenting South Sudan in that case, in advocating for ending child marriage through uh, developing um, through uh, reviewing or developing customary uh, laws and policies, uh, there are challenges that we 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 encountered uh, as also humanitarian actors. And those challenges, yes, of course, range from geographical, political, and also perception. So, and then perception. So, it's something that we, we need to touch. Uh, recently, when we were uh, uh, 
uh, working on, on, on ending child marriage and especially in, in one area in, in South Sudan, one of the states, uh, we were um, uh, um, the, the Minister of, 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 uh, of Gender, Child and Social Welfare was impressed with the work of humanitarian and he recommended that we should be able to review other customary laws, be able to ensure that we, 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 we come up with uh, laws that harmonize, especially on setting, uh, on setting the marriageable age. But we encountered challenges. That is where I want to drive this particular context. One is the, uh, the protracted, the conflict within, within the country that make other areas not to be assessed. And, and also because of the climate induced factors such as flooding, which is also in the tropical but also uh, other challenges of polarization of the communities in terms of the other political divides also comes in and make it hard to reach those particular areas. And, and, and also there is a particular thing that I want to say about the, 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 the perception. Uh, there is also uh, a misinformation or a, a misunderstanding about the concept of human rights in those particular areas. So their understanding is that any harmonization of the of the laws will erode the long cherished customs and practices and be able to bring in the aspect of human rights to them that human rights is only women rights i don't know why they understand it that way human human rights is women rights and and you could see the cultural barriers and all these long cherished practices be able to uh, prevent supporting this particular uh, uh, informal justice system so we were a bit constrained in moving forward, but we still believe that there were also opportunities that we explore uh, to be able to also uh, reach. Uh, one of those things is collaborating with, uh, uh, with, with, with the uh, local government authorities uh, in reaching, be able to sign the memorandum, as I mentioned earlier on, and we are moving forward to us to reach those particular areas, but also, uh, uh, also be able to, uh, uh, conduct uh, trainings in, in ensuring that uh, in, 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 in shifting minds and perspectives about uh, the work of this, but to be able to let them understand that it's about supporting, strengthening, but not eroding their work. So it's about supporting because majority of the South Sudanese actually resorts to informal justice system. And because in our context and in our legal system, most of marriage and, and, and family issues are addressed at the customary courts and which become important. And these customary courts are all over distributed in the areas that cannot easily be reached, either because of perception, because of political agencies or because of geographical limitations or road networks. But we are moving forward. Another thing that we, we, we also do, which we have uh, noted from our colleagues um, from IDLO before, that we also support the uh, the, the, the ADR uh, uh, mechanisms that are already in place, be able to ensure that they strengthen, they are trained. But I also noticed another challenge is sustainability of this mechanism. Because when the project ends, they cannot continue with their activities because there's no motivation from that side. And which again makes it a hard to reach area again because they will not continue for a long period of time. And this is where we need to craft strategies, plans, and our uh, um, designs to come up uh, and address this particular issue. But this is where we are and we're moving forward. I hope by, by next year, we should be able to reach particular areas and be able to develop more uh, customary laws, review them and align them with the national laws, ending child marriage, gender inclusivity and the informal justice system where we are working on it and other areas that we may identify. Over to you, Paula, I'm, I've been uh, too speedy because of also time, but I think, uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, over to uh, IRC colleagues, uh, Chakrid. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing well your name uh, from uh, Thailand uh, on uh, partnership. Uh, welcome and over to you. Thanks. Hi. Um, Chakrid, do you want me to present? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe. Uh, 
I think I mean, what what I was uh, going to to talk is about our yeah then the, the might touch upon the different different questions including for the the partnership and hard to reach people yeah so this is an example of the IRC Thailand uh, implementing the uh, legal assistance center uh, in the refugee camp in Thailand so while while waiting for the uh, present uh, for the PowerPoint uh, I just want to give you like the uh, a bit of the context, like the, the work that we are doing here is for the people from Myanmar who crossed, uh, who are in the refugee camps in Thailand uh, is almost like 20 or 30 years. And also the, the new arrivals of the uh, people who crossed from Myanmar to seek support, uh, to seek safety in Thailand from the current conflict in Thailand. So now we are talking about uh, provide uh, access to justice for the in Thailand for the peoples who came from the uh, ethnic justice system from from Myanmar come come to Thailand yeah so <clears throat> and uh, I think the the way that uh, I think the simple way that we are doing for uh, for that is just I would like to talk about like maybe like three uh, three step that we are doing so the first one, um, the first one is like we bring justice system into the refugee camps, and the second that we find a way to gain acceptance, and the third one is uh, about the uh, set up the the system and the people. Yeah. So, uh, Tito, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so I think from this step is to uh, address the challenge at the beginning when uh, it's like when people come from the uh, another from from Myanmar to Thailand, uh, the first challenge that we see that they are not familiar. That that is the uh, the typo. Sorry, like they are limited trust and not familiar with the host country justice system. In this case, it's like uh, with the Thai justice system plus the experience of them like where they were like corrupt, harassed by the Thai authority. That also make them not not trust and not feel comfortable to access to the Thai justice system. And also with the the legal status on the undocumented peoples, uh, particularly who living outside the refugee camp, which is they also have like the barrier to, you know, travel to uh, get access to the police stations or some like legal center outside the camp because they can be arrested as the illegal person anytime. And when they are the refugee for the refugee camp, they also have no permission to live outside camp where the all the support on the access to justice is outside the refugee camp and then with the control from the authority when they see like uh, the legal rights is may harm or impact to the to the national security so when we start introduce this this uh this approach it's also like a lot of control and a lot of question from the uh from the authority yeah next next slide please yeah and i think the good practice that i would like to share here is like when i say bring justice system into the camp in order for people to to uh to get that when they cannot leave camp to get the the support this is the uh the work that we do, like how we can facilitate the case that need to go to the Thai justice system, which is more like the the, the serious crime that cannot handle within the, the, the camp system and how the system that can mitigate uh, for the minor crime that uh, we can manage by the, the camp justice system, which is we need to gain acceptance from the authority in terms of except that like we can bring people who have document to see the police or uh, we can set the system the mediation system the group conference for the refugee camp by lead by the the refugee people so i think <clears throat> At this point, it's very important to get that acceptance in order to get the entry points and uh, the ownership from the uh, from the refugee people, uh, particularly uh, in case that the the minor crime that we manage in in, in the refugee camps, and uh, for set up the system. So I think this the way like uh, we we work on like develop the document called the mediation and dispute resolution guideline. Uh, which is like the guideline that 
uh, the book that talk about what is the definitions of each crime, what is the procedure, what is the uh, role and responsibility. Because on this, you know, and implement the, this uh, guideline in all the camp, um, the good practice from, from doing this is like, uh, we uh, using the community approach, bring them into the developments of this, uh, bring uh, invest on the capacity building for the refugees and community volunteers. I think additional from like our colleagues talk about the, talk about the uh, capacity building. One, one approach that we work in Thailand is like we bring in the people from uh, universities or from the formal justice system to provide a training. So uh, additional from the knowledge, it's also about the recognition of the people who receive the training because even along the way we get permission to do this but the Thai authority also you know watching a lot like how this uh, process look like is there anything will harm to the Thai justice system so like bring in this also like build the coordination build trust that is the main thing that we aim is like the recognition to the people who play this role particularly in the uh, mediation center that we uh, support in in the refugee camp um yeah advocate to the thai authority is is very important and i think one of the key thing i want to share here is like the message around what is the benefit of doing this to the host communities you know like uh when we ask people, we can have people who are not Thai, who are refugee, access to this or develop the informal process for them to manage their result, their conflict in the camp. What is the benefit for, for the host community? And also balancing the community practice and the international standard. Uh, one example is like uh, in the community practice, the adultery is a serious crime we see to have to be imprisoned. But in the Thai law, Adultery is a minor crime. So when we bring in something like chain, it's really important to like communicate properly to them on what benefit on that, and then what is the step up change that we uh, that we can <clears throat> thinking uh, that that we can see for that, and also for for them to like start adjust to the to the new to the new thing, and also uh, when to you know, break through the limitations of access to develop the diversity option for the exit is also very important. So, you know, have a community volunteer in the refugee camp near the people at the village level as a household levels. Also one one option that we we working on that using cash uh, for protection, like support the legal assistant is also one thing like make it fast for the services risk reach into the risk into the 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 peoples yeah and also the uh work closely with the uh, local organization who can get accept you know get trust from the community is also uh very key um <clears throat> uh key point for uh on the good practice uh next slide please um and yeah, I think the key lesson learned that I would say is the long term funding is very critical to make sure the continuation and the success, because that is not only just like make a service there, but it's uh, how to con you know work about the perception and the system strengthening. So you need, uh, you know, a a period of time to to work on that. So in IRC Thailand, we luckily to get uh, on the first date like five year funding, uh, which is we can make uh, this system in place. Uh, integration to health services, uh, to the livelihood uh, or the women protection program is so very uh, effective in the way that that all service is always the service that the legal need disclose there and then can be the entry point that they know how to refer that to the to the legal centers yeah so and then uh knowing contact you know as i say like gain acceptance from the community on the community is very important or the ethnic uh, leader. So I think we need to know like what is the key concern that we can use as the attraction point that they can accept the change that we we going to to work on that and also like uh, balance the powers between you know the authority between the local leaders 
to the people. So I think this is also one thing like through uh, more communication, uh, find the common point that what is the benefit of having the informal justice system in the place that people have no solution for that. It is very important and it's also taking time for, for that one. Yeah. So I think I will stop there and then uh, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chakrid. And uh, Jonathan, I, I don't know, there are several questions in the chat and I see that there are just uh, a few minutes left. Uh, if it's OK with you, I would uh, uh, launch the, the, the questions as well and then feel free to answer some of them and maybe may, uh, linking it to uh, the last point on how to reach. Uh, does it work for you, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We can do that. Thanks. Uh, so there is a question from um, a colleague from Hill, the Hague Institute for International Law, uh, about technology. I don't know, Stefano, uh, sorry for uh, uh, making you a spontaneous volunteer, uh, but uh, maybe uh, you could reflect about uh, how to use and leverage technology um, to accelerate or address some of these challenges and what opportunities look like. Um, while you think about the answer, uh, there is a, a question uh, to Daniel. I don't know if you can see it in the chat. Uh, what is your, your organization doing in regards to the normative legal legal framework review uh, by the Law Review Commission. Um, and, uh, and also in relation to the discriminatory, discriminatory definition of rape, excluding marital rape address through cost, the customer in redress. Well, I guess you are more expert than me on, uh, on the legislative framework in regards to this um, uh, uh, disposition of the law. So, uh, Stefano, over to you for the first question and then Daniel, and then we'll take the other questions in the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. I'll try to be quick. I see we don't have a lot of time. Um, so I already spoke about a few um, areas, um, few ways technology can be used. It needs to be really focused on the context. So there are cases and actually locations where, for instance, uh, radio is the best way uh, to reach uh, the local population. Um, there is, of course, now a proliferation on the use of smartphones and smartphones uh, can be used both uh, for training exercises. For instance, this is done, I know, in uh, Rwanda with the Abunzi, uh, where they use um, um, training exercises that they can actually access quickly through their smartphones. And uh, if they're looking for something, they can just go there and, and, and search for the information. But on the other hand, there are other countries, I can't remember exactly where now, it would come back to mind, where uh, smartphones are used also by justice seekers when they need to search for something. So yes, you can get uh, legal advice from paralegals and legal aid providers, but sometimes it's just a question of putting in your information and basically searching uh, for for, for what you want. There is now more modern in information. We know artificial intelligence is also taking step and could actually provide some kind of answers. And uh, this is a bit uh, an ongoing discussion on, on how to use artificial intelligence also in justice processes. There are a lot of discussions, for instance, in India on how to use artificial in intelligence in the justice system. Um, but since we don't have time, I'll stop there and then we can have a broader discussion one other day. Over to you, Paula. Uh, thank you, thank you, Stefano, for the answer, for uh, for being brief. Uh, Daniel, over to you. Uh, and then I see that we have uh, um, uh, hands raised from the audience, so I'll give you the floor in a minute after uh, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. <coughs> thank you so much, Paula, and thank you, Elijah, uh, for your question. Uh, what uh, Sena is doing is, is on uh, reviewing the normative framework, and that is coming with at this time of continual development in, in South Sudan, we're moving to permanent constitution and also reviewing other laws as part of the uh, implementing the agreements. Uh, I would say that uh, South Sudan, uh, Sina's participation is not so much directly in, in the law commission because of other factors, constraints, but however, we also share our reviews uh, through the civil society networks 
and also in our uh, coordination meetings. And of course, we believe this, uh, our representative from civil society networks are able to attend uh, the uh, the law commission reviews uh, conferences and, and, and sitting. So they also share the same thing. So that is what we, we do with particular area on uh, normative framework. But particularly on the second questions about um, what also with respect to uh, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory definition such as the rape. Yes, of course, I understand this. And it's an area that we, we, we also in the penal court act uh, as to marital and also that the, the definition of the uh, of the rape in South Sudan also tends to include defilement, which actually to be a standalone. So it is a bit uh, uh, obfuscates the understanding, but this is what we're doing. Uh, as soon now we review uh, this particular uh, law and, and, and see, okay, the question that comes from there, which I think is, is pertinent also is, as we seek to harmonize the customary laws with, with, uh, with national laws on addressing child marriage issues, issues of gender inequality, but what about where we find that the, the, the national law is also discriminatory in nature? That is, I think, that where the problem comes. Our approach is two pronged. That's where we identify that the customary law is articulate and very correct on a particular position. We don't seek to harmonize with the wrong position of national laws. So what we do is to move what is the national standards or human rights standards on this particular area. And then we, we engage in discussion with them so that they have understanding the national law may be wrong on such definition, but the national standard is correct as to this definition. Also building on their own uh, uh, areas of strength under the customary laws. And I want also to note that, okay, we have also reviewed so many, but we haven't shared with them because we still lobby for funds to be able to implement other areas and organize more uh, workshops and training and, and consultation meetings on this. So this is particularly what we do in that area. We do not take the wrong position in the national law to address the other one. We better use the national standards on that. Thank you. Over to you, Paula. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for for the for the question and for clarifying. Uh, so I'll give you the floor very quickly to um, Josephine first, and then uh, Barbara for the two questions. If you can introduce yourself and also address the question to the to speaker. Thanks. Thank you so much. My name is Josephine Chandiru Drama. I work with Steward Women in South Sudan. Um, I am the chair of the Rule of Law Technical Reference Group of the GBV AORA in Juba, and I see some members of the uh, Rule of Law Technical Reference Group here in the meeting, Jack Jackson Ogeno, Betty Achan from UN Women, I see Merlin from the GBV AORA representing IRC, and I also see uh, Betty, uh, um, I see Doris Moga from the UNMIS Rule of Law. I, I want to just appreciate the presenters and panelists this afternoon uh, for their presentation and for Daniel for well representing South Sudan. I think I did participate in the uh, report or the findings of the diverse pathways report that is being presented here. And I think everything that we we shared with you is well articulated in the report. Um, and then uh, I, I want to really share on the issue of coordination since I am the coordinator for the rule of law, uh, the, the issue of fragmentation of coordination system in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with Daniel on that. And I want to say that we have the uh, UNDP rule of law forum that meets monthly. And then we have the rule of law technical reference group of the GBV AOR. Those are two uh, forums that meet monthly. And you find the one for the UNDP as the government institutions, while the one for the GBV AOR does not include government institutions. This is because the one for GBV AOR is chaired by a national organization that might be undermined or looked as a small organization, while the one for the UNDP has all those higher level partners. But in both uh, forums or spaces, there are no um, 
the customary or informal justice actors participating unless they are called on occasions to specifically justify certain areas. So that is something that I wanted to put clearly in terms of the coordination, but I do agree that the just informal justice sectors are doing amazing work. Like we work with them as steward women. We do what is called the family court because according to the local government act, their role is to handle family disputes. So the ones that we work with, we call them the family courts. Um, and out of nine members, we ensure that three of them are women. So this forms about 33% of them being as women. And they do a lot of referrals, as some of your report notes. But what we have been battling with is, should these informal justice uh, actors be part of the uh, GBV referral pathway? Of, because currently they are not part of the GBV referral pathway. So this is a question I've asked to the GBV ORA. Of course, they said no, because of the they can't follow the SOPs, but this is something that we should continue conversing on because the, the, the justice, informal justice actors are doing really amazing work. Um, and then I want to just add something on the issue of the marital rep. As, as Daniel noted, uh, the marital rep is stipulated in the penal code act. And the work that we are doing currently on this is we have done a position paper to criminalize marital rep. And this position paper has been submitted to the um, Southern, um, Law Reform Commission. We are waiting for it to make decision on that. But as we wait on that, we also have the anti-GBV bill that is in the pipeline and it has been submitted to the Ministry of Justice. The anti-GBV bill has also already criminalized the marital rep, whichever comes first from the uh, Law Reform Commission or from the Ministry of Justice. We are looking forward to ensuring that marital rep is criminalized in South Sudan. And this is part of the implementation of the Maputo Protocol for upholding the rights of women uh, in Africa, where South Sudan is also really very inclusive. So we are trying to ensure that the, by the time the permanent constitution comes into play, some of these uh, rights-based violations are put right by the permanent constitution. So this is where I wanted to make my intervention. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, very good points uh, on uh, coordination and multiplicity of, uh, of platforms and relevant questions, I guess, uh, um, for Daniel and the colleagues on South Sudan. Uh, maybe over to uh, Barbara for the last question. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Barbara, for being uh, short and sweet. <laughs> OK, I will. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm Barbara McKellen. I'm the Global Advisor on Housing, Land and Property for the Danish Refugee Council. Um, started started earlier this year. And so first, like everybody, I know I have to be short, but I have to thank everybody for the you know, really excellent uh, and informative um, presentations, particularly the examples, the recommendations. So I just wanted, I had one remark and one suggestion. The one remark was to highlight the specific problems that exist when engaging in, with customary systems in context of conflict and displacement, because often it happens that customary authorities uh, have lost legitimacy because of the role they played in the conflict or the side uh, they were on, which means that then certain people no longer want to approach them. So that's something uh, rather specific. If they have been displaced, well, the community no longer has access to them. Um, and uh, so that creates a difficulty because then if they've been discred discredited, new body arrive. And in Côte d'Ivoire, you had youth groups who decided to start engaging in addressing HLP disputes and contesting the authorities of the elders. So the multiplication of this dispute resolution mechanism creates a forum shopping which decreases legal certainty of decisions. And so these are very specific aspects that um, you know, should be taken into account when deciding to engage, because the general message is engage with existing mechanisms. 
but what if these mechanisms have been compromised in, in relation to their own? So that's one aspect. And also, especially in relation to HLP, when the community is displaced, if there's HLP disputes, customary leaders don't have authority on the land where they are displaced. So you can't really go to them. You would have to address the leaders of the areas where they are displaced. Um, so all this uh, means that it's a bit tricky and there are some risks associated to engaging with uh, customary justice. We all know that. Um, and I think, uh, in particular in the case of DRC, this is something that limits the engagement of some humanitarian organizations with customary justice. So I really feel that we need guidance. Um, I mean, we've heard great examples, but um, I think it was Jonathan who talked about not reinventing the wheel. I will have to develop guidance for DRC on how to engage, I mean, in my case, on HLP with customary justice. So I was wondering if, you know, would it be possible, and I don't know if it's within the remit of the this task team, but because they did such a great work with the Legal Aid uh, analytical framework, is this something that this group could take on to develop some guidance on how to engage with customary justice in uh, humanitarian settings? And then, you know, we could put the respective expertise and guidance that exist. DRC has done some work jointly with NRC, IRC in Afghanistan. I mean, OK, I'm not developing, but, um, you know, we could start first by creating a sort of repository of what already exists. And then based on this, develop a sort of joint framework, which any, any everybody could benefit from. And I think that would improve access to justice uh, and limit the risk of creating harm, doing harm uh, through inappropriate engagement with the uh, customer justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara. I think very relevant points. Uh, on the on the task team on law and policy, I will leave uh, to Martina the, the closing remarks, but definitely an area for work. Uh, maybe also in coordination with the, the housing lands and property areas of responsibility. I know that they hold a meeting on engaging with customary uh, and informal justice mechanism on the on, on in uh, in October, and they touched upon this issue as well. Uh, so something to look at definitely. Barbara, and I'll uh, maybe pass it on to Daniel uh, to respond to uh, the different questions, uh, counting also on uh, on your uh, um, summary skills. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Paula. I want to thank uh, Josephine and Barbara for their uh, uh, insightful sharing. And uh, I took note of uh, one of the questions that uh, uh, Barbara's post actually is, is somehow rhetorical, and then she she has also a position, I think, on this. She and of course I, I tend to agree with that position, but we need to understand. Yes, uh, should this informal justice system be part of the GB referral pathways? Of course, she is now an expert in that area. This is just my personal opinion in what I think can be done in this area. And, and we took note before in our presentation that sometimes there is a lack of uh, a comprehensive and in-depth understanding of informal justice and how they operate. In the context of South Sudan specifically, if we, if we see how they used to deal with issues of rape then, probably one aspect which was not there is medical uh, attention, but they had a very organized way of dealing with these issues and it's especially on issue of um, uh, confidentiality. There is how they used to deal with them. These, these, those who are engaged in informal sector system. So if we want to bring them on board to be part of referral pathway, we need to, whether they would follow the SOPs is another thing. But I think, and I tend to agree, notwithstanding challenges, if they are well trained, equipped, and, and appreciate the SOPs, uh, they, they can be included and they will be of great help. They will be of great help if they are included, uh, tapping on that. Uh, uh, that original knowledge on how they deal with issues of rape as well, it could be important, but it's something that we need to be cautious in now whether we can include them now or we need more time to deal with the, with them. And thank you for sharing your insight on, on, on the issues of the rape and then uh, the, 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 the position, the people position and then uh, those areas. Uh, if I got you well on, on whether I can also make a, a quick summary of, of, of what I also made, uh, is that what you said, Paula? 
Uh, yes, no, thank you. I wanted just to uh, to to see your reaction on Barbara's point on the risks of engaging with existing structure, uh, informal uh, mechanism um, in conflict settings. Yes, 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 sure. Uh, ma ma thank you. I, I think something I mentioned maybe in my in my paper, I did not come with it, is it's challenging as, yes, in, in the context of displacement and conflict, the, the informal justice system are, are, are compromised. I'm also seeing it uh, from another angle, which is part of particularly what I'm looking at in the customary context, is that uh, when displacement happens, many communities are now brought together, and, and then you see the informal system may not be adequate or sufficient to address so many communities with different diverse customs, cultures in one particular geographical area. And that poses a challenge to uh, informal justice system, I think is, is, is one of the challenges. But uh, our approach on this side is about when, when, when the customary laws and the policies are harmonized, if one community is displaced from this side and move to this side, they'll be able to have uh, a confidence that if they are to approach an informal system, they will get justice because they know this are uh, these practices, although different, there is an aspect of them having been harmonized with the national uh, legal norms and they will have these particular areas. It's challenging from our side, of course, uh, Josephine will understand, it is until recently on land issues that we resolved the issue of question of ownership of land, but then it was difficult. So who actually own land became a difficult question and who to approach whether informal or formal justice system was another thing. So the conflict, bring a lot of challenges in this area and then displacement. But I think there is a need, I agree with you, need to develop guidelines on how to address uh, these particular matters and, and, and then be able to move forward and address those challenges. I think I tend to agree with that. Uh, uh, thank you, over. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Barbara and Josephine, for your uh, very relevant uh, question. I can see in the chat there are several questions and suggestions, but I think we are uh, running out of time. Uh, I will uh, definitely advise you to enter the page of the program that uh, Martina kindly shared, also to look at the legal aid analysis uh, um, framework that constitutes a basis for uh, the analysis, including on informal justice uh, system. Over to you, Martina, for uh, really some uh, very quick closing remarks. Thanks. But, uh, thanks so much, Paola. In um, more than closing remarks, no, just to remind everybody, no, well, thanks so much to the speaker. It was absolutely amazing. I think everybody acknowledged and recognized the, 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 the amount of work that you put in this presentation. I think it really, it really showed that it was extremely useful for all the participants. So thanks truly once again. And, and we'll be following up on this. But also just to remind you, we put the, we shared the, the, the page of the project, the, the, the legal aid analysis tools. Please feel free to keep reaching out to us in the legal task in, uh, in the in the in the task team to Katrin or myself as the chair as your entry points. If you'd like to hear more about what these tools are about, how they can be used uh, in your context, we'll be more than happy to talk to you to the protection clusters or to the different AORs as relevant. We'll we're just there. Please feel free to reach out and and and, and let us know because we know a number of partners are thinking about applying the tools in a number of countries that um, such as Somalia or others maybe where we haven't um you know that are relevant to your work so so please feel free to reach out and just also to remind you that all the the learning that we are collecting from these exchanges with all of you will be reflected in a compilation of practices and effective approaches and strategies uh, that uh, paula is currently working on and that we will be able um you know to, to have a full draft soon you know ready also to share to those that would like to be involved and and, and review etc just just always let let us know we'd be happy to to have you so Catherine, i don't know if you'd like to say also anything before we we conclude i'm not going to keep people uh, busy we're already quarter past three but yeah, uh, yeah again just uh, echoing the thank you for the great uh, comments uh, the great um, uh, presentations a lot of interesting questions that we didn't get to which is really a pity but uh, it seems that there is a lot uh, to learn and to share so uh, to be continued i would say and we'll find more opportunities to to share good points from uh, yeah i mean this is a very rich topic so i, I can go on forever but uh, thank you everyone it was uh, really great to hear and uh, yeah that's it for me, Martina. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Please.
Paola, Bye, and everyone. in this case, thank you again, everyone, <laughs> and we'll be in touch. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, everybody, and again, a special thanks to the speakers for for their work on their presentation. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Paola ti chiamo.